Well, it's five after. Uh, why don't we go ahead and uh, get started, uh, if you can. If you want to draw your attention down near the front, as we like to say. Uh, I'm uh, Professor Neil Hamilton uh, here at Drake, and I want to thank you for coming. Uh, I'm very pleased that you're here for what we hope is going to be a great day. As you can see in the program, we've assembled a uh, solid uh, set of uh, uh, programs and speakers, and uh, we're very excited about uh, the information from today. Uh, we're, Drake is very uh, pleased to be able to organize and host this conference. I want to thank all the sponsors and exhibitors, and you might take a moment, hopefully everybody got uh, uh, their program, and uh, she got a program and a, uh, a list of conference attendees, and you'll see on the back two pages the sponsors and exhibitors, and people have displays out front. Make sure you get around and talk to them and thank them for their being here and what they can provide to you. I want to give a special thank you to Mark Gannon uh, for his uh, interest and support. Uh, for us having Soil 2017 and for focusing on the role of uh, uh, landowners and stewardship. Mark uh, just came in the back room. Thank you, Mark, for everything that you did. Uh, I want to thank uh, my colleague, Matt Russell. Matt, uh, wave at him, farm away from Anita. And uh, had the, uh, Matt's the Resilient Agriculture Coordinator in the center and uh, the real laboring war on putting together this program. And our team from uh, the law school, Anna Jordan, one of our students, and. Uh, uh, Sarah Hughes. I also want to thank Melissa Miller uh, with the Water Center, Greg Townsend from Farmland Stewards Solutions. Lots of people to thank. Okay? Any comments, questions, anything for good the cause before we begin? Matt, an announcement? Yeah, if you want to access Wi Fi, uh, it's the DU guest. So if you look at networks available, DU guest, click on that. Has anybody, anybody been able to do that successfully? Yes? Okay, people are on. Thank you, Matt. Anything else? Any other comments from anyone? Well, if not, uh, we'll go ahead and uh, uh, fire things up. Uh, again, uh, I'm still Neil Hamilton uh, from Drake Law School, and uh, it's a real honor, opportunity to be able to visit with you on this subject of landowner duties and stewardship uh, to our soil and water. Uh, a subject that obviously is dear to all of us. It's why we're here today, uh, visiting with some of you in the hall who haven't gotten enough rain. Uh, uh, the fact that the crops look as good as they do is a testament to the soil and its carrying capacity and, and uh, how it can help us. So, uh, you know, uh, this was uh, the era of my parents, uh, our Adams County farm down southwest Iowa. Uh, but we don't uh, farm uh, like our parents uh, do or like my uh, parents do anymore. There's Zell. Uh, we all go through uh, some changes in life. Uh, there's the young boy professor. Uh, agriculture's changed. Uh, the laws changed. And you can ask me what it took to get that sash away from the beef queen that day. But uh, uh, Mark Pearson, uh, an, an old friend, uh, uh, we were at the fair doing his radio show, and that happened. Uh, but the land and uh, the values remain. Ray may recognize uh, uh, that combine and maybe even that field because it's uh, down on uh, uh, his farm. Well, you know, my goals uh, for today are three. Uh, I want to talk about three main topics with you. Uh, first, I want to talk a little bit about Iowa's legacy of leadership on land stewardship. Secondly, talk a little bit about how we got where we are today in terms of this conference and maybe also where we are in our state with soil with some observations from our Soil 2015 conference. How many of you in the room were there for that conference a, a year and a half ago? It's great to see you uh, uh, here again. And hopefully we'll all be here for Soil 2018 as well. And third, I also want to share some thoughts on the role that landowners play in stewardship, which is obviously where you come in and uh, where you should probably be uh, telling me about it. Uh, but So my goal today is not to hector. Uh, or lecture uh, you, but instead to set the stage for our discussion. I want to begin with a, a little history, uh, uh, because as I think about Iowa and land stewardship, you can't but not think about uh, the towering leaders that our state have produced. Uh, people like Aldo Leopold and Henry Wallace and John Lacey and Ada Hayden and, of course, uh, 
uh, Ding Darling, and other folks of more recent vintage like uh, Paul Johnson and, and Senator Tom Harkin. Uh, you know, Ding uh, captured our challenge as well uh, 80 plus years ago as he wrote about the impact of flooding and soil loss and, and land conversion. And I think we miss him and miss his voice uh, today. Uh, you know, we had ecological leaders like Ada Hayden and, of course, Aldo Leopold. Uh, and uh, Leopold had many things to say about uh, land stewardship. And, of course, here's a, a great quote from Leopold about the answer, uh, the remedy being an ethical obligation uh, on uh, the part of, of landowners. And we had, uh, and I'm pleased in that regard, as we speak about both Darling and, and Leopold, uh, Sam Kaltinsky uh, from uh, the Ding Darling Institute's here with a display of Darling's work. And I'd encourage you to stop by and, and uh, remind yourself of Darling. And of course, the Leopold Center uh, is uh, one of our co-sponsors today. And Mark Rasmussen will be with us uh, a little bit later uh, this morning. Uh, we also, of course, have political leaders uh, from our history. Uh, you all recognize the chap on the right, uh, Henry A. Wallace, uh, or perhaps I think Iowa's greatest agricultural leader. You might not recognize the fellow on the left, John Lacey, who was a congressman from Oskaloosa. Uh, but if you've ever heard of the Lacey Act or the Wildlife Protection Acts that protect migratory birds and feathered birds, or more recently, if you've ever heard about the fight over the presidential designation of monuments. Uh, he was the author of the Antiquities Act, uh, which is used, has been used probably to protect more acres and more sites in the United States than any other uh, law. Well, of course, we know that Henry Wallace had many things to say about soil. This is one of my favorite quotations of his about the social lesson of soil lace, waste. No man has the right to destroy soil, even if he owns it in fee simple, the soil uh, requires a duty of man. We've been slow to recognize. He said that in the forward to the yearbook of agriculture in 38 soils and men, and it's perhaps as true 80 years later uh, as it is uh, as it was then. Well, I'm going to put on my lawyer hat uh, for a little bit, and uh, so this is either a time to go get some coffee or uh, uh, check your emails. But uh, for those, uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, uh, the context for uh, the idea of stewardship. But in the context of the concept of duties, right, uh, we all recognize that uh, duty is another way of helping us think about things we probably should do uh, and uh, why we think about them. And, you know, the duty of stewardship in Iowa can arise in a number of ways uh, by state law, such as ours on soil conservation and compliance with soil loss limits, uh, by the rules of participating in farm programs. Uh, such as conservation compliance, uh, though it's important to recognize that uh, the farm program rules aren't regulatory in nature because farm program participation is voluntary. Uh, you're being paid to do it. Uh, they can arise by a contract or conveyance. We're going to talk today a lot about written leases and farm leases. Uh, by a participation contract, right, if you're in the CRP or the CSP, uh, if you've gotten cost-sharing money from uh, uh, the public, uh, you signed a maintenance agreement that said you'd maintain the practice for a certain period of time. Uh, it might be in a conservation easement, such as one you might sign with the, the Iowa Natural Heritage Foundation or Nature Conservancy. Uh, it can arise by an implied covenant. You know, under Iowa uh, law, and a lot of our farm leases are oral, and so if you ask yourself, well, what exactly is the legal content of an oral lease? Well, that's part of the challenge is figuring that out, right? I mean, you hope you can remember what the track was and what the rent was and maybe the term, though an oral lease is only going to be for one year. But the courts also imply a number of implied covenants, such as the idea you have to give the property back at the end of the lease. Uh, well, one of the implied covenants that the Iowa courts also recognize is an implied covenant of good husbandry. Uh, and then you can fill in the blanks in terms of what that means. It can arise by a marketing agreement, such as you have with a number of private groups getting into private conservation, supply management, and of course also by personal ethics. And that's what Leopold uh, was talking about. Well, you know, uh, there are uh, three key examples of Iowa case law and, and statutes on the duty of stewardship. Uh, you know, back in 1943, the Iowa Supreme Court dealt with the constitutionality of the new law at that time 
that required advance notice of termination of farm tenants, something that we're all familiar with today. It's been extended to September 1st. But in saying that it was something the state could enact, they also made this interesting statement about the role of the people who own land and how they control the food source of the nation and they bear a responsibility to the general public. And they possess part of the national wealth and laws designed to help them implement stewardship are within the state's police power, a power the state used in our soil conservation law, the law that establishes uh, minimum soil loss limits, or maximum soil loss limits, really, uh, at uh, the county level, and 161A43, making it the duty of every landowner uh, to implement conservation uh, practices. And uh, the third piece of that pie was when that law was challenged, the constitutionality of it, almost 40 years ago in Woodbury County, and then when the Iowa court said, well, of course, right, the state can establish soil loss limits on landowners, uh, because of the importance of our soil resources to the state. It's a vital natural resource, it's our greatest resource, and we have the right uh, to protect it. So even with those laws, we know that uh, uh, soil erosion is a reality, uh, sometimes worse than others. Uh, here's some of the soil we love so much that was being bulldozed off the bike trail next to the Des Moines River uh, a couple of summers ago. And, you know, as I think about this legacy of uh, leadership, I guess my question is how do we make sure that this legacy of leadership doesn't become a, a ephemeral gully of inaction? And, uh, you know, part of the challenge in that regard is thinking about our current reality. And, you know, what are our numbers on soil loss? And what is the real measure of our progress on water quality? What is our commitment to uh, stewardship? And are we facing an increasingly contentious future? But you can all draw your own answers uh, to those questions. Uh, and, uh, but I think that uh, uh, we need answers. And, and that's in large part where you come in, because in many ways uh, uh, you're, if not different, you're at least exceptional in terms of when it comes to uh, land stewardship and your land. Uh, you are interested in what's happening on it and how it can be improved. That's why you're here. And, uh, you know, there are a number of reasons of what may be going on in our state uh, in terms of have we lost some of our focus on soil conservation, have we turned our attention to other issues, are we unwilling to uh, think about conduct that may be antisocial, are we afraid to actually monitor the water because we're afraid of what we might find out. Um, and, you know, because agriculture and you know, this is a comment that may strike you as uh, hopefully not offensive. Uh, maybe you might not believe it, uh, but you know, agriculture's relation to water quality is in large part unregulated, especially when it comes to cropping practices. Uh, there's very little in the Federal Clean Water Act that relates to agriculture uh, because of the issue of non-point source. Uh, there's no local regulation on water quality in our state. And there are a number of agricultural practices, practices that all of us may well engage in or do that we think about, whether it's putting in drain tile or clearing land or farming up to the bank of a stream or allowing the cattle to wade in the, the creek or the timing and the amount of when we put on fertilizer. But it's important to recognize that almost all of those activities are free of any form of regulation. And that doesn't mean that they need to be regulated, but it means to the extent that people think about the impact those practices have, it largely comes from your own heart and from your own mind. Well, so we can, uh, can we change our situation uh, to improve it? Uh, well, I think we can. That's why we're putting on uh, uh, conferences uh, like this and uh, uh, right, so we have to uh, uh, acknowledge the reality of our situation. I think we have to give landowners and groups committed to stewardship uh, the resources and support they need. And we have to actually provide right, the funds that are needed to help make this happen. Well, you know, at our, uh, at our 2015 soil conference, we discussed many of these things. 
And I'm going to quickly list what I think were the 10 key observations that came away from that conference with. Because they're in many ways uh, the foundation that helped lead us to where we are today. One of them was that we need to ditch the idea of tolerable soil losses and instead think more about soil health. We need to change our thinking that there's a certain amount of erosion that we should accept and plan for as opposed to shifting to thinking about soil health. We need to ramp up adoption of cover crops and continue our research on those and looking at their use and the use of other related field edge practices like vegetative buffers, helping keep livestock on the land so that we have more grassland is certainly part of that. We have to engage ag retailers uh, to make them, uh, uh, engage them in the effort to reduce nutrient loss and promote soil health. And we have a couple uh, exhibitors and speakers here today that are going to address those topics. Uh, we have to get landowners uh, engaged in soil and water conservation. And of course, it's um, uh, telling the choir which note to sing here, but uh, right, the issue of the landowner's role is critical. We have to work at the watershed level and use collaborative watershed planning approaches to develop uh, practices so that neighboring farmers and landowners can work together. Look at the opportunities to harness water quality trading, working with groups that are subject to point source uh, limitation. I think we need to uh, support the sales tax increase, or at least look for how we're going to fund the Natural Resources Trust Fund that 60 plus percent of Iowans approved in a constitutional vote in 2010, uh, designed to provide the type of chunky resources that uh, the state can use to carry out the type of watershed activities that are going on around the state to carry out projects like the restoration of Lake Darling, uh, the restoration of a geode lake, right? I don't think our state lacks for opportunities uh, to use these funds and to work with landowners and farmers that want to do this. But coming up with more than the eight or 10 or 12 or however you want to count it million that we provide a year is one of the things that's necessary. Using the data analytics that we've been collecting in agriculture, and how we can harness that to improve the way we farm. And supporting the soil conservation laws that are on the books or looking at what might be needed to make them more effective. And making sure that farm programs actually work to protect soil and water and that our programs aren't uh, working at cross currents. So those are some of the things we came away from soil 2015 with. And I hope that next year, uh, if we get together and have soil 2018, uh, that we're going to be talking about uh, the observations that uh, came from today and how we've been able to uh, continue the discussion. Well, so this is where you come in, uh, right? Uh, uh, the role of landowners. And so, you know, some thoughts about the role of landowners in stewardship. You know, it isn't someone else's job, and it doesn't happen by accident. Uh, I think it requires thought and action. Uh, I think you recognize that. It's directly impacted uh, by how you farm, uh, the choices you make, the decisions you make, right? Uh, and, uh, which uh, practices we use and how we treat the land. Conservation, I hope, uh, shouldn't be seen as a cost, though it may well have costs associated with it. Uh, not just something that we do if you can somehow show that it's immediately profitable. But instead, as an investment in your land, I can only guess that uh, my friend Jerry Hatfield may have a little bit more to say on that subject in his next talk that's coming up about the economics of conservation. And so stewardship is inherently a responsibility that goes with land ownership. Our laws make that clear, uh, but this isn't something that a law can make you do, right? Uh, uh, you can look at the law as kind of you need a bigger hammer and if this doesn't work we'll have another hammer. Uh, but uh, you know at the end of the day hammers aren't really the answer. Uh, you know committed to farmers and landowners and stewards are. So taking responsibility for how we farm our land. Well they help set the stage and we're off to a running start and my gosh I'm going to get done a half hour early the way we're going. Uh, you know, to help set the stage for this, I sat back and I thought about, well, if I was going to 
create a list of questions or kind of a checklist uh, of what uh, uh, I might ask myself as a landowner in terms of uh, what's the way that I can gauge how I'm involved in stewardship. You know, what would be on that list? And of course, there's nothing magic to this list. Though anybody that's ever had me in a class know I love to make lists, right? And you can always uh, put things with numbers. But so here are 12 ideas or 12 questions uh, that uh, uh, I come up with. Uh, you know, the issue of our leases. Would they have provisions on soil conservation? Would we have communication and conversations with tenants and between tenants and landowners about soil issues uh, rather than leaving it up to guess or to happenstance? Uh, would we have updated conservation plans with the NRCS? I think there's a lot of confusion about who needs a conservation plan or whether you have a conservation plan or the purpose of them. Uh, but uh, I think you know, it's hard to argue that uh, having thought uh, comprehensively about uh, your farm, not just the highly erodible land that may be subject to uh, cross-compliance or conservation compliance provision, uh, would you have a nutrient management plan all right, that lets you think about all the different sources of nutrients that are coming on to your property or leaving it and giving you a way to avoid uh, uh, what may be over application of nutrients or the timing uh, of when those are put onto the land. Uh, of course, lots of places, swine manure or other forms of livestock waste are an important source of uh, uh, fertilizer. Though I think you probably all know of anecdotes or situations where People have manure applied to their land, but don't take any credit for it when it comes to the fertilization decisions uh, because of either uncertainty as to the quantity or the quality or where it was located. Uh, and so, right, have we thought about that? And uh, do we know whether or not our land is being used for manure applications? Buffer strips, would we have them along the streams so we aren't dragging iron out over the stream bank? Uh, would we have grass waterways and be thinking about other investments in conservation? Would we fence the streams so that the livestock, I mean, if I was in a cow, well, I'd love to be laying down in the middle of the stream. Uh, but uh, that doesn't necessarily mean it's either good for the stream or the water quality or anybody else that uh, might want to use it. Would we be using cover crops, experimenting with them the way any number of people do? And I know, Ray, you planted thousands of acres of them this year. Uh, down in Adams County, uh, and looking at other practices that uh, we believe address water quality and improve soil health. Would we know the actual soil losses being experienced on our fields uh, from the current farming practices and be seeking to reduce them? And I know uh, stands here with Agron and uh, the idea of having a, a real-time soil loss calculator, right, so that you have an idea of actually what's happening on the soil this year right, uh, at a farm level. And of course what uh, Rick is doing with the daily uh, erosion indicator at Iowa State is part of that as well. And then, you know, I put this one up, would they test the water leaving their land or in the streams that run through it? And I tell you, this one led me down a rabbit hole, right, because once I put this on my list, I thought, well, you know what, I'd kind of be interested in testing Sugar Creek that actually flows through our farm. Right? It's a tributary of the raccoon. We live south of Waukee. And so that set me out on a journey to try to figure out how you could actually test your water. And an unfruitful stop at soil conservation in Adel, who said they didn't do it. Tri Extension, well, they didn't do it. Uh, the Iowa Water Program is uh, in many ways almost defunct, though it's in the news this morning that it's being handed off from uh, DNR to, to private organizations. And finally, I was out at Mark's office and talking about this, and Mark said, well, geez, you want a, do you want a nitrate soil testing kit? And I said, well, sure. And he went in the other room and gave me a box of a retain kit, which was a project of the Conservation Districts of Iowa. Right? And so I'm happy that CDI is here, and they have some retain kits out on their uh, uh, booth. I forgot to bring it in from the car and show you, but oh, it's neat. Uh, and I've tested uh, the water on my creek a number of times. But certainly part of the lesson that I took away from that is we don't make it easy. 
uh, we talk a lot about water quality, but we don't make it easy for anybody to necessarily test it. And I think that's something that we can change. What would we know the carbon or organic content of the soil? And I didn't try to go down this rabbit hole, but I'm sure it may be as windy, right, in terms of uh, uh, how we actually test for that. But if we're going to talk a lot about soil health and improving carbon, well then, you know, what kind of tools and measures do we have to help people actually uh, measure where they are and make progress? And of course, right, oops, my gosh, I'm already jumping. Uh, would they consider enrolling in the public conservation programs, the CSP, the continuous sign-up CRP? Matt, are we still taking anybody into the continuous sign-up CRP or are we tapped out? Don't, I haven't heard a word that we're tapped out then. Okay, now you should know Matt wears a number of hats and one of his hats is he's a Drake, but he's also on the state FSA committee. So if any of you are having a problem with USDA, uh, Matt's in the red shirt uh, in, the, uh, in the back. Uh, well, those are some of the questions that uh, I came up with, and so in many ways that's my message. Uh, landowners, as you recognize, are critical to stewardship uh, and to Iowa's land, uh, and we aren't going to make a lot of progress without you. Uh, we can make room for nature. Uh, we obviously have, right? Our state wouldn't have uh, the beautiful rivers and streams and lakes that we do have if it hadn't been for uh, the actions of landowners protecting those resources and working with others uh, who do them. Uh, and so we can use them, we can create beautiful things like uh, this wetland, uh, we can have lakes where we can sit and loaf after we get done putting on conferences like this. And, you know, another comment is that, you know, I'll, I'll, hop on one of my other hobby horses for just a moment. You know, we've done a lot of work around new and beginning farmers. And uh, landowners have an important role to play uh, as we think about new and beginning farmers. And if Iowa wants new farmers, uh, the landowners that we have now, particularly those who may no longer be farming or aren't sure what their long-term plans for the land are, need to think about the opportunities to uh, bring new people in. And uh, this is a picture of uh, a proud day in my life. Some of you may think it sounds more like a tragedy, uh, but this is when I sold the last of our family farm to uh, the neighbor's boy, and Ray's over here, and this is his son Chris, uh, so that it could be his first piece of land, and he could build a new farmhouse on the farm that I grew up on. And my thought was Adams County didn't need some guy living in Waukee owning a piece of Adams County uh, and thinking he was still involved in farming down there as much as it needed somebody who actually was farming. And so you can sell land. I know it's heretical to a lot of people, uh, but it happens. Uh, and uh, you can do it under your own terms as well. So I'll end with a couple of my favorite slides, uh, my favorite farmer and little girls and kitties. Uh, because they always make people smile. So with that, uh, I'm done. We're a little bit ahead of time. I could either, at the, at the risk of uh, uh, sounding stupid in our am, uh, open it up for questions, uh, or uh, we can uh, move on to Jerry Hatfield. Does anybody have a question, comment? Uh, uh, Matt's approaching the bench. Uh, oh, we have microphones. Yes, we do. And so Ray Gasser. From Adams County, I think many of you know Ray. I just, I just think we got to congratulate you because he uh, made it a point to, to make sure that my son had an opportunity to buy the last 68 of the farm. And, and if he would have put it up for auction, it would have bought more than he sold to Chris Paul. So thank you, Neil. It's one of the proudest things I did. Right next to when we gave another piece, so when I gave a piece of, my wife and I gave a piece of my great grandfather's farm to Adams County Conservation Board to put in that prairie uh, that you saw the picture of, of Hamilton Prairie. Uh, I just wish I had more land to, to give away. But other comments, observations? Question from Ms. Terry in the back. Mike over there, Matt, is it working? You're not so sure? Okay, well. So we got an early start, uh, right there. It's not working. Jan, can you uh, shout loud enough or want to try a different one? 
betray this guy. He'll take them all. Well, the problem is the problem is they all the same. <laughs> Anybody want, has a loud voice that has a question? Uh, oh, geez. Okay. I think you got them all working. Uh, right there. Yes. I a lot of work for this one. So my brother was killed in a farming accident several years ago, and his gravestone says steward of the land. And I think it's probably rolling on right now to see what some people call stewardship. So I think if there's a way that you could talk about how we come up with a checklist, like a definition of stewardship, and start with five to 12 things that you have listed, how can we do that? Well, I think I appreciate that, and I'm sorry to hear about your family's loss and, and uh, your brother. Uh, but you know, that checklist of those questions was in some ways uh, an attempt to do that. And if you didn't hear a question was, you know, can we come up with some idea uh, of a checklist of stewardship? And you know, this is an exercise, you know, that you could each do, you know, and maybe you already have, right? Or you've done it perhaps intuitively because it's reflected by the actions uh, that you take. But if you had to sit down and come up with the list of, well, here are the five things that I do that I think reflect my commitment to stewardship. Or here are the five things that I avoid doing because I question the impact they may have on the soil or water. That, I think, is, is one of the ways it helps generate uh, that list. Uh, you know, I realized that uh, you know, we didn't fence our cattle out of the stream in 1960. I'm sure my dad would have thought, well, why would we spend that much money on fence, right? I mean, my God, you know, the cattle like being in the water uh, because we didn't necessarily, you know, think about the water as being something other than it was ours. Even though once it went under the culvert over into the Bavards, right, it was somebody else. You know, and as I wrote that comment about watersheds, it also made me think about that, right? Because I think that from a, a physical standpoint, right, as we think about water uh, hydrologically, it, it, we understand that, well, yeah, thinking about a watershed, my gosh, that's, that's our approach. It should be. You know, something that I do upstream could be swamped by the actions of somebody a mile away, right, that uh, uh, wipes out, right, the benefits that I added to the water. But I don't, at least, again, when I was growing up, I, I couldn't even have told you where that creek, right, that starts, and maybe Ray can, I think it runs into the 102 River at some point, right, and it even kind of starts in the back end of our section. Uh, but, you know, we just, we don't think that way, right? I mean, we think about grids and county lines and school districts and maybe where the mail route comes from, but we don't necessarily identify with the other people in our watershed. Right, is thinking that in many ways we're probably more connected to them, uh, certainly from a farming standpoint, than we might be what the school district is, and maybe even what the county line is or the township line. And uh, I mean, that's not to say that we need to go back and reorganize our soil and water conservation districts into watersheds, though the state of Nebraska did that a number of years ago, so it is possible. But there's another, boy, well, I'm giving you a whole bunch of homework. Uh, right? I mean, you know what your watershed is, right? Your Huck 12 watershed, kind of the smallest one that we use, and who else is in it? And, uh, right, have you had a watershed uh, meeting? You know, Larry Weber and the Flood Center uh, is leading this, uh, right, HUD-funded project on watershed management uh, uh, approach in Iowa, and uh, there's some great things happening based around watersheds. I think part of the reality is, though, that we're only doing it in a very small number of the watersheds that we have, right? Uh, part of the lesson of the restoration of Lake Darling, and some of you may be down in, from the Washington County area, and of course Sam's here with the, the Darling exhibit, and uh, one of the videos that he has is a video about the restoration of Lake Darling, right? But, you know, the state and the locals put together $16 million for that restoration of that lake and that park that it was on the impaired waters list, was unsafe to use, the dam was leaking, the, the existence of the park and lake were really in doubt, but they put it together, right? They drained the lake, they rebuilt the dam, they rebuilt the park facilities, but they also entered into agreements with uh, at least 59 of the 70 farmers and landowners in the watershed to put in permanent conservation practices 
to retain water and silt on their land to protect the quality of the water that's flowing into that lake. Well, you know, the lessons of Lake Darling could be applied in every watershed in the state, right? If you had uh, that type of commitment or organization or in that situation a motivation, right, to protect that lake. And so that's why when I write that comment about how it's not somebody else's job, right? Uh, when you read about a watershed project, you think, wow, Hewitt Creek, we're going to hear from Jeff Pape later today about what they're uh, doing uh, up there. Well, you know, hopefully part of the inspiration from that is, well, we ought to go home and think about what we can do in our watershed, right? I mean, there's no reason that it's somebody else's or just somebody else's project. So, well, nobody else is going to risk answering a question if they get a 15-minute answer. So I'll make the next one shorter, and we'll get ready to turn it over to Jerry here at some point. Jerry, when are you supposed to go on? 9 o'clock? Okay. You got your engine running, so we can get you going sooner if we need to? Okay. Any other questions, comments, anything else for the good of the cause? Anybody? Yes, Linda Bidner, former member of the State Soil Conservation Committee. Right? What? That, too. And we were on the Leopold Center board together yes. for a long time. Just to comment, as those of us who are doing estate planning, and I see a number of people with Harris Gray as mine, we need to be sure we write those conservation processes into our estate plans so that they stick. Uh, we were involved in an unfortunate situation, but nonetheless, the conservation ethic that was my father-in-law's, did not get written into his estate plan and failed to carry it to the next generation that was more interested in income than conservation. Well, yeah, that's an interesting question because I think you can and appreciate it and thank you for the remark. You know, one of the questions is how do we do conservation so that it stays done, right? As opposed to having to do it every generation, right? Or every time the name on a deed changes or the name on a lease changes, right? Uh, and certainly there's going to be a certain amount of turnover. I mean, that's natural. But, you know, you would think we wouldn't have to keep learning these lessons. And, you know, one of the reports that came out in the last month or so that I'm sure many of you read uh, concerned the issue of the CRP program. Yeah, I remember when the CRP program came around. Ten years seems like a long time. Oh my God, ten years! You know, and compared to what we were doing at that time, ten years was a long time. Well, it was thirty some years ago, right? We've been through three ten years, all right, since then. And there's been uh, a number of properties that have been put into the program two or three times. And you know, the CRP was an amazingly and is, you know, a, a really important program. And I think that people may have forgotten the multiple purposes of the CRP when it was implemented in the 85 conservation title. Uh, it wasn't just a conservation program or a wildlife habitat program. It was also a set-aside program, right? It took us out of the business of annual set-asides. We use it for supply management. It was a financial right, support program because it bailed out a lot of people who were in economic situation. And it stabilized land prices, right? I mean, land prices in southern Iowa had dropped much below what you could, in fact, pay for them with on a CRP rental agreement. And now some of those things today, right, I mean, we talk about the CRP and people are concerned about how the rental rates interfere with people's ability to access, access the property. But, you know, the issue about land coming back in after the CRP, right, I mean, after having been in and coming back into production, on the one hand, you can look at that and say, oh my gosh, we lost all that investment in conservation. And that's probably true if we thought the investment was permanent, right? Uh, we didn't lose the conservation that happened during that time, right? You can identify how much soil stayed in place during those years. But now, right, we're back to where we started again, right? And that that soil may be in danger of moving again, unless the system that we put in place on it makes sure that it's protected. And you know, I think that you could come back and ask a question, well, you know, are there ways that we could use some of that money more effectively? I mean, we could have purchased, right, permanent easements for streamside buffers on most of that property, right, and actually had a permanent, right, conservation protection, still had the land in private ownership, still had it, right, 
available for people's use if they wanted to hay it or graze it or use cellulose on it or whatever. But we didn't think like that, right, with uh, how we've implemented the CRP, at least historically. And so part of the challenge of conservation, and I think it was one of the 10 observations at the end, maybe I didn't mention it, was we need to continue to support innovation in how we think about conservation. And, uh, you know, it's, it's not that these issues, they aren't new, right? Water quality is not a new issue in Iowa, even though some people love to make you think it just came up two years ago. <laughs> well, it's been around for 30 or 40 years or longer, right, as has soil conservation. But that doesn't mean that we don't need to think about new ways to address it, right? Or to take the ways we're trying to address it and adjust them to the other types of institutional changes that have happened. Certainly the structure of agriculture that we had in the mid 80s when we wrote the CRP program isn't the structure of agriculture we have today in terms of the scale of farms, uh, the amount of tenancy, uh, the number of non-operator landowners, and so these programs need to, right, be flexible enough to stay relevant. And, putting my lawyer hat back on for a moment, uh, that's one of the reasons and roles that law plays, right, as we develop what these programs look like, right, the commitments and the language in the lease, or in your situation, Linda, how is it that you actually uh, somehow integrate a commitment to conservation and stewardship into an estate plan, right, or into the language of how the land's transferred to people. That sounds great. I'm noodling over exactly what it looks like in terms of how you do it, right, in terms of, uh, of what the language looks like because uh, uh, you know, I just taught a class, and a number of my students are here, uh, a class last week on land tenure. And of course, you know, the premise of our land tenure system is the nature of the property documents, the idea of the, the lease you have, or the, the deed you have, or the life tenancy that you may have on a property. And uh, uh, we do a very good job of making sure that everybody knows what they own. Right, and we don't have much land in Iowa where people go, I have no idea who owns that, you know. So we just, that doesn't happen, right, in our system. But the issue of how we've somehow included in the language that goes along with ownership or tenure something that deals with the stewardship question, that's different. I mean, and it's not that it's not possible, certainly conservation easements are, right, the prime example of that potential. And even, you know, there are things that you may be involved in that you don't necessarily think about as being a conservation easement. I mean, the CRP agreement is a conservation easement for a term, right, the 10 or 15 years. If you have land in the WRP, right, or the Wetland Reserve Program or the CREP program, that's a permanent, right, easement in which, right, a part of the fee has actually been, right, sold uh, to the DNR or to the USDA. Well, one more question uh, before we get going, Mr. Delaney in the back. Well, I didn't plant these questions, so uh, 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 in, uh, in response to your comment about conservation not being new, yes, I have 1933 Iowa conservation plan put together by Leopold and Dingaro. Mm -hmm. Anybody wants a copy? Get a hold of me, Mike Delaney. And was that the 25-year plan, or is this is it? Because they had a, there was a stack yeah. plan, a 25-year plan for our parks and lakes and everything. One well, of the chapters were written by Leopold, you can tell. Yeah. It's just right. It's yeah. and, I, and that plan, and Joe with the foundation, you know, we look at it as well with the land that we're in discussion with landowners about. And lots of the property that the county conservation boards acquired when the county conservation boards were created were lands that were identified in parks and places that uh, uh, were kind of designated for protection. And at one time, the state was going to have a national forest. I don't know whether any of you knew that, the Hawkeye National Forest in uh, southern Iowa. Uh, it didn't actually end up happening, but uh, uh, much of the land that the state then acquired and put into the state forest, the Stevens, for example, had been acquired by the USDA, right, when they were reacquiring uh, foreclosed farmer's home land or Bankhead Jones land 
under the rural resettlement uh, program of the late 30s, it was being reassembled to turn into a, into a national forest. Uh, and a lot of that land we're still dealing with today, right, in terms of farming it or putting grass on it or looking for ways to protect it. Yeah, and thank you. Well, thank you for coming. Uh, any other final comments, observations? We had a lot more new people come in. Thank you. There's still, as always, seats down front.